Welcome to Making It Happen, a career in the performing arts where we discuss how to break into the performing arts industry for yourself or your child, teen, or young adult. Guests include professionals who are passionate and share my vision of helping talented individuals land professional representation and have successful careers in the arts. My name is Lisa Solek and I am the CEO and founder of Making It Happen, a career in the performing arts online courses, having helped hundreds of clients break into the performing arts business on stage, in films, television, commercial work and more. This podcast is supplemental to my groundbreaking online courses. For more information, check out all the ways that you can benefit from my courses, how-to videos, live seminars, my free weekly newsletter, and free guides. Go to lbctalent.com. My guest today is Teresa Pfefferly. Hi, Teresa. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm so good. I was in New York today, which was so fun. Last night, I went to a show at 54 Below, which, you know, oh. a lot of New York for a, a client who was doing a showcase there. He's a senior, gonna graduate from U of Miami um, at the end of this year. So yeah, end of 2024. So that was fun and exciting. So I rushed back. I'm very excited to talk to you. Um, I think that the listeners are gonna have a lot to learn from you, especially moms who have children who are really talented at a very young age. So um, if you could introduce yourself and oh, explain boy. a little bit a little bit about the background, maybe start at the beginning. Um, okay. Just to give people a general idea where you're coming from would be great. Hi. Okay. Teresa Trigus Pfefferly, the mouthful. My friends call me TTP, call me Teresa. I, yeah, so start at the beginning. I mean, I had a, my youngest daughter um, was a dancer at a young age. You know, in preschool, one of the teachers told me, look, she's got this. Like, don't stress out. Let her do something that enables her to explore other things besides education. Don't worry about, she's gonna be just fine. And so at the time I was like, oh, wow, that's great. What is that gonna be? You know, piano lessons, dance lessons. And I took dance at a young age. So I thought, oh, okay, let me put her in like the tumble time kind of ballet little classes. And within two years, the owner of the studio said, "You're at that young age was like, your kid is a natural dancer and you should increase next year. Maybe some of her classes don't burn her out. She's a baby. So fast forward, you know, a couple years later, we moved and took a summer class just to kind of audit the situation. And I think it was like by the end of day five, you were like, listen, your kid has really got this and I could make a phone call tomorrow and your kid could be repped with a manager. And maybe let's start getting her into competitive dance classes to see how she retains information and get started there. And so that was at five years old. Yes, she was very young. She was very yeah. young. And that's yeah. a tricky, it's a tricky age. And to be honest, most managers and agents will not sign children who are under the age of eight or nine. Um, they'll usually send them out. You know, they'll send they'll send them out, but they won't do an exclusive contract with them at that age unless they really see potential, you know, so it's pretty amazing that that she got repped at such an early age. Yeah, it was like I think it was. So that was August and then December you had hosted an open mic night and we went just to see the kids. Right. Like, oh, let's just go see the kids. And at the end of the open mic night, she said, I want to do that. So. Then I think it was the end of January or February. She had just turned six years old. So she was like four weeks into being six years old and you hosted another one. And she, you know, had a couple voice lessons just to get her familiar with. And she got up and sang her Ariel song. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is history. Yes. Yeah. Quite yeah, a yeah. journey. I know. Yeah, it was really pretty amazing that she got up and sang at that age. And I think for parents who have children who are asking, mm -hmm. you know, that they want to do it, um, it's the healthier way to go rather than, you yeah. know, pushing them, obviously, um, because they have to be the ones to get up and do it, you know? Yeah, so that was at that point, I think it was that juncture that we took the, your class, the parent class. Uh, yeah, the seminar. Mm -hmm. Yes. And absorbed the information and kind of came home and said, well, if she's likes this and going to do this, I feel like we should make some choices now that would maybe be helpful for her in the long run. 
So like things like we got her passport <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and got working papers, just sort of like started having those conversations, you know? So mm-hmm. I think within six months, I think by June, she was rep with, with Shirley Grant at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which Shirley Grant, for those people who don't know, was and um, is no longer a thing, but for a very long time was the top children's wow. management company on the East Coast. Yeah, for sure. Do you want to talk a little bit? Because you mentioned um, working papers. You want to talk a little bit about those? Because oh, yeah, I mean, sure. people, you probably said working papers. People are like, what? My, what? I thought you got those when you were six, <laughs> oh, when you were 16. What are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, talk about that a little bit. And what so the, the, um, as they should, the government has checks and balance in place for child performers. Stop me if you'd like to, but one of those things is you have to have a Coogan account. Mm -hmm. Um, Coogan is based after Jackie Coogan, who was the child actor who was... um, Little Rascals. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. California. Yeah, so I guess his parents had taken his money and didn't save him any. And so Mm -hmm. there was late years later lawsuits and as a result there was laws put in place so you have to have it's sort of like a child trust account mm-hmm. and that's part of the working paper process but also every state has individual rules and so we're on the east coast working papers would be in new york state because that's where you would be going into manhattan for auditions and work most of the time right so um, yeah, it's based it's wherever yeah the working papers are forever the project is based out of yeah And so um, it required us to get medical sign off, like the doctor had to sign off, the school had to sign off, and we had to sign off, and we had to show proof that we had secured a uh, Coogan account. And and it was like very like, (laughs) like, oh my God. (laughs) Yeah, 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 it's crazy. Yeah, and usually, yeah, the the Coogan accounts are based in California, and you do have to get a locked trust also, so... For most people in Jersey, New York, they have to have a locked trust or just the Coogan in California works. And that is because by law, you have to put 15% of all of the gross income that your child makes doing any of this into this locked account. So when they turn 18, I believe it's 18, they can have access to their money. And, um, you know, the other 85% is really up to what you want to do with it. Some people use it to pay for training. Some people use it for the travel back and forth, whatever Mm -hmm. it's going to cost. And other people put that into a separate account for their children for when they get older, depending on their financial situation at the time. Right. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So so it was definitely one of, it was like mild, like levels of milestone, right? Like, (laughs) (laughs) well, it's a little overwhelming in the beginning. Yes, it is because it's a, there's a lot of moving pieces I feel like it's Mm -hmm. like it's simple but yet it's not right yeah yeah Yeah. now at the time did you own your I know you own your own business and Mm -hmm. um if you could share a little bit about that and if you owned it at that time when she first started and how you balanced that and the process of you know getting the audition and what that was like you know it's changed a little bit to date because of the self-tape space that we're all in now since COVID but Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, once things and things have opened up a lot, a lot of people have to go in person now, as you know, for callbacks or director sessions and all of that depends on what coast you're on. But if you could explain a little bit how you balance that as a parent with other children in a business, that would be fabulous. So it was a little challenging. I mean, I am a real estate broker and so I have some flexibility of time. Not always, right? Because Generally, what that means is you're at everyone else's time and not your own. However, I juggled that and it was, you know, in the beginning, it was definitely challenging because it was very much a once she had the manager at noon, sometimes we would get sometimes it's 11 in the morning or noon. We would say, hey, can you be here today at 330? And that would mean everything would stop. And you would say, okay, now I have to call the school, tell them I'm coming together. Whatever I planned on doing, I'm no longer doing. Or my husband was no longer doing. Or, you know, we at once we were about a year in, you know, maybe two years in, we had a babysitter that was 18 that I took with us a little bit. Um, to familiarize her. And there were times where if I couldn't do it, my husband couldn't do it, we would send her. Um, but it was very much that, 
you know, if we were lucky, we got noticed the day before. Well, if it was theater, we got noticed usually sooner, but mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. commercials and television stuff, it was mm -hmm. last minute notice. Yeah. Could you go into a little bit of detail about what it was like in the moment you're in the city, you're going to the casting office and what transpires in that, in that waiting area and in that room for everyone? Yeah, so there are two different dynamics. So we'll talk about theater first. Typically, when you're going for a theater audition, first of all, getting into the city, if you're not a, used to navigating the city, your anxiety already is like here. Because you're like, oh my God, I just last minute, I got I to gotta get in and I got to get to this and I got to have here. And then she's six, seven, eight years old, got to go to the bathroom and like, and I got to have her rehearse a song because she's got to go in and be on pitch and be herself and her normal personality in a strange environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it came to theater stuff, you know, someone is probably going to tell me I'm like not parent of the year for this, but I would take her to Starbucks first and get her like some kind of frappe, some kind of bubbly, fruity, chocolatey sugar drink. First of all, you come out of Penn Station, it's like a block away on your right hand side as you're walking up 8th Avenue. So yeah, yeah, you're yeah but wait, it. hold on. In your defense, you're picking her up after school at like two thirty, three o'clock or one thirty, or whatever. And yeah, she's so out all day. Yes. So, yeah. She would she be at the energy by. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so by the time you pick her up, pull her out early or pick her up right a little bit before dismissal. Cause if I waited until the buses were over, then they wouldn't release her. So there was all of that navigating with the school because they wouldn't allow me to come get her in the time that I wanted to come get her, which meant I had to get her early. And so I would get her early. We would, to keep her as calm and cozy as possible, I would drive either into the city, which meant the tunnel and parking, or it meant, because it was definitely 40 to $60 to park. If you're paying to park and you're not parking on the street mm -hmm. and then 16 17 18 dollar whatever but i would either drive all the way in to keep her cozy as possible let her nap let her read her lines let her practice or we would drive for us to newark was about 45 50 minutes and then we would park in newark for 20 dollars and take the train in and then i didn't have to navigate the car it was a closer walk like literally we chose newark because she did not like the walk from the parking lot in Secaucus, she did not like to walk from that parking lot into that station, even though it's a much more beautiful station. She just didn't like to walk that far. So we would park in Newark because it was literally right there. You walk like that little two lane road and you're right there. It was never about me. It was always about how is she going to be more comfortable? So for theater, walking into the room sometimes meant we would meet someone to rehearse for an hour before, you know, run to Pearl Studios or some you know, Ripley, get a room, meet someone, have her run her, run her song over and over and over and over again and feel like she was fully warmed up. And then we would leave there and go to wherever the audition was. Sometimes it was in the same place, sometimes it wasn't. And that typically, for the most part, was quiet and well ordered when you would walk in. You know, mm -hmm. there would be someone there with a sign-in sheet, you would sign in her name her agency and the time that your audition was and you would just sit quietly in the hall they would call her in you wouldn't have any idea what was happening and you were in and out in five minutes and once or twice it was 15 minutes and that was on a callback one and that was i could see the name of the studio the casting office in my was it telsey was it at telsey yes because she met with the director for Frozen. So she was with him for 15 minutes. Usually, the, so when you're in Telsey, it's usually more people, but it's orderly. Everyone's just quietly sitting there. You know, sometimes the kids, you get familiar with some of the kids and the moms because it's generally the same age-ish. You're going to be going in for the same things. So that was very nerve-wracking um, because you want to hear so badly what she's doing and saying and you can't and you're trying to at times 
position yourself in the room as close as you can to being like eavesdropping without looking like a crazy person. Because the last mm -hmm. thing you want to do, you know, you always taught me, you just wear beige. If you're the parent, you're just wearing beige. Like you just fade into the background, like you don't matter. And so I was always aware of not wanting to be obtrusive or portrayed mm -hmm. as difficult yeah. in any way. The <laughs> other thing is you don't want to upset the child. You want to keep them in this positive headspace. And you do want to make sure that they know what they're doing when they're going in there and all of that. But in that moment, you're having to suppress all of this, like, oh, just, you know, you want them to do well. You want them to just do well in the room. Like whether they book it or not is not really a big deal in those spaces when they're so young. It's more about let them have a good experience in the room. We hope that they do their best. Whether well, they're going to do their best try, no matter what, they really are. As a parent, you have to play it so that you don't show them that you're anxious oh at God. all. The worst. The worst. That was. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting, that's... though. It's exciting. It's exciting, but that's probably one of the more difficult things because you want to hear feedback because mm -hmm. you want to know if I need to do if I need to help do something different. So what true. is it that I need to do? And they, they're not going to give it to you. They're going to say, Oh, that's great. And that's yeah. all you're going to get if you're lucky. And that doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything other than they were like a nice, appropriate little kid. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, you have to understand, I think parents have to understand in that space, even if you're at a call back there, they might have had hundreds of kids in for the initial call. And maybe they're bringing in 50 kids, maybe 25 for sure. the callback or the director producer session or whatever. They don't have time. They don't have time to Business. call every single, even if they called every agent, if an agent or a manager had sent in, they each sent in four to 10 kids for the open call or for the agent call, let's say the initial call. Yeah. They don't have time to even get on the phone with a rep from you know, your agency, your management company to say, this is the, what we saw and this is what we liked or didn't like. It doesn't happen because they just yes. don't have time in their day. Neither does your agent or manager have time right. to like take those calls. It's more your responsibility as a parent and the people that you have working with your children. It's their responsibility to stay on top of the industry, which is another really important thing that I think parents, especially those who now that things have opened up since, you know, COVID prior to COVID self tapes were a thing, but now since everything opened up, um, it, that is definitely a thing for the first filter of any project. And so there's people all over the country that can send the videos of their children in for various auditions, but you really have to make sure that you have your child with someone who knows the industry. I think if you're just at home practicing with them on your own, it's just too hard. I mean, I think you were well, smart. Definitely the warming up situation was mm -hmm. valuable. Although yeah. I will say this, like they're going to two things about that. Mm -hmm. Number one, they're going into adult situations as yes. children. Mm -hmm. And although the casting directors are appropriate and kind, it's a business situation. So you can no longer be the parent who says, well, that that's a child. You have to talk to my child like a child and you have to treat my child like a child or that's not fair. Well, then you should absolutely not put them into this business if mm -hmm. if you can even think to yourself that that's not fair because mm -hmm. it's a business. So there's that. And also having the right team in like even in the prep moments, there were times where we had a teacher who we loved dearly, who was fabulous and no one could play the piano like them. But there were times where he was so invested in the and my daughter that he would get nervous and yeah. then his nervousness would show up and then my nervousness is showing up and then you've got this poor six-year-old eight-year-old kid who's got these two adults who want them <laughs> so badly to do so well and mm -hmm. the kid is the one who's calm you're like yeah, because... running around like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? The kids, I think we know this too in our hearts that the kids are talented. We know that they're that talented and that they, they can handle themselves in the room. And we do have to sit back and control. And it's more excitement, wanting them to do well, excited that they have the callback, excited they have the opportunity to audition, especially, you know, you get a call, you have a callback for Frozen, the musical. You yeah. are 
wow, this is yeah. something big. Like we want to make sure he, she's prepared, which you always did because you kept the training going, which is always important too. I think there's a lot of parents out there who say, well, I'll wait for an audition to come up and then I'll give my child some training for that audition, which I, th I think that's been the MO more recently, like in the last 10 years, it's been tough. People just want to do the training prior to the audition for the school play or prior to the audition that they get from a manager and really the time to train is, you know, as you know, the time to tr do the training is when you don't have an audition, when you have that time off, you know, how was it with the, <laughs> it's, so, it's so funny. It's so crazy. I, it's so crazy of a parental journey, but like yeah. an amazing life experience for yes. her. There's like so many things that, you know, we could go in so many directions about that when you go. So to just circle back real quick about what the room looks like when you're going for commercial, that is an entire crazy, chaotic, how do I say appropriately without using foul language, like madhouse. And you'll be in a room, holding room with sometimes a hundred people and kids and there's no rhyme or reason. And you just got to sit there and wait your turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, yeah crazy based on the and, order that you sign in you know based, based on, on the order that you sign in and then you're like why are they not and there's no like they cast the parents sometimes after they bring in kids and then they're like oh we have a callback but oh guess what no we decided to cast these parents with blonde hair and your kids got dark curly hair and so that's not going to work and you're like <laughs> I, I don't i'm speechless yeah speechless it's just a different yeah. Dynamic scenario and, mm -hmm. and it's run yeah. a little differently. And, and yeah. so there yeah. is that. Yeah. And I think the kids have to be comfortable in that setting. Cause a lot of times with commercial work and you probably found this, you're, they're going to bring in five to 10 kids sometimes at the same time, maybe four or five kids at that age, at the same time, they're yeah. going to ask them to slate, which is say their name and who their mm -hmm. agent is and may, possibly their age. And they're going to ask them to do that one at a time and step forward from a line. And they're going to be filming them at that time to see how strong they are with their speech, what they sound like. And can your child be confident in that moment? Or are they going to be silly and laughing with the kid next to them? Those things are really important because it's chaotic outside the door. Yes. And then when it's their turn to go in, because they're going to take you in order of how you sign in because people get delayed and you have a time that's given to you. Yeah, but then people are coming and everybody's rushing from school and all of that. So everyone and in New York, they really can't hold auditions until I believe it's three o'clock. It might have changed. Three yeah, three o'clock. So between three and six, or possibly six thirty-seven, mm -hmm. depending on if it's callbacks. Mm -hmm. That's the only time frame. Did you ever? Let me ask you a question. Did you ever have to go to more than one audition in the same afternoon? Yes. You want oh to talk god. about that? Just touch on it. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. In, multi, in different parts of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. With a young child. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. What did you country. do? Did, did you park the car and then just take a cab? Or did you, you didn't move the car, did you? I totally moved the car. You moved the car? I had no idea how to navigate the subway. <laughs> okay. That, that hasn't been until the last year and a half. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. it's a thing when you go to multiples. And sometimes, especially with children, because Lila was really than that hot spot for children because the hot spot for girls is usually like eight or nine to 12 or 13 depending on how quickly they grow and develop and for boys it's usually like nine to maybe 13 14 again depending on how quickly they grow and that is just such a sweet spot yeah. for commercial work commercial print a voiceover work the broadway scene you know as long as they're under five, five foot five two i think the cutoff's five two now yeah. And usually they're not going to hire at five two. That's the cutoff. So yeah. if your child, oh, yeah. we, used to, child right? we used to bend, she used mm -hmm. to bend her knees like softly. Because <laughs> they measure them first. Mm -hmm. You walk in the room and they measure them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes sense because if you're if you're someone who is on the production producing side, you don't want to hire someone who is then going to grow mm -hmm. and end up being too tall for the role in too short an amount of time. They might go into the role for only a month and then they're out. So they really want to, because usually it's um, 10 pounds or two inches and you're out of the show, they have to replace you. And the Frozen tour more recently, 
Martinez was on the podcast and she talked about being on the tour and what they did with the frozen tour. Re this is recently. They were replacing the children every um, three to six months. They would just replace them with someone else. And if they stayed smaller, they would give them an extension if they wanted it. But for the most part, that was a it was a big thing. It was a constant rollover of kids going in and out of that. You know, it becomes almost like an assembly line of talent going into the shows when they run for a long time, which is also crazy. Wait, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to be on set? Yeah. So that's definitely fade to fade to beige, right? Like, yes, it is. Because they hire your child. They don't hire you. Your yeah. transportation and safety. That's yes. it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, what would happen normally would be you go in for the audition. They call you back and there's a small group, maybe six, maybe 15, right? And then they would narrow it down to two or three and they'd put you on hold. And oh yeah, you wanna explain that a little bit? And yeah, so hold basically means we like you, we may call you, we may not. <laughs> so when you get a call that your child's on hold, don't celebrate and tell all your relatives. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, Because yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean you have it. <laughs> yeah, because I think there was one for Colgate that specifically, and that was a funny one because we were not told that the callback required pajamas and we show up and everyone but us is in pajamas. And I was freaking out and sent an email to the management team at the time going, everyone is in pajamas, what is happening? And their response was, well, it must've worked because they want her on hold for tomorrow or something like that, okay. whatever. Yeah. Um, and then they never, they never pulled the trigger on her, which could be parental. They could have cast a parent or she could have been like their backup and they were just needed somebody in case the other kid got sick or didn't show up mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes I think too, sometimes they're going to pick like a short list of three to five kids. If the child is the hero character, which means in a commercial space, the, the lead character in the commercial, yeah. if the child's the hero, they don't know if the client wants a person of color or if they want someone with dark curly hair, Caucasian, or they want a blonde or a redhead. Sometimes they're not sure. Sure. And so even if they're the hero character, they're going to present that, you know, short list to the client to decide, yep, you know, yep. client meaning like McDonald's, if they're, if they're creating a McDonald's commercial. And like you're saying, if the parent turns out to be chosen and it doesn't match, your child doesn't match, then they're, they're going to let that go. And usually on holds, they don't even call you to say that you're no longer, you're being released. I mean, sometimes yeah. they do to say, listen, you're released from that hold, especially, and usually only when there's something else going on. So if your yes. child has a wardrobe fitting for something else, they have a callback for something yes. else, then they'll say, your child's released, take them to the callback. Yes, but yes. if there's nothing happening, you just, the date goes by and you just assume that they didn't yes. get it. Another reason to not worry about it. Yes, exactly, which is very difficult. But so that's, so I just, I wanted to mention that, the whole situation, right? And so then what would happen is if they actually did book you, and you would usually go in the day before because wardrobe wants you and you have to wherever they're shooting or wherever wardrobe is you have to meet them for out one to three hours typically and then you go back home and then you go back on the shoot days and so while on set you're basically like you just get them there and you get them checked in and kind of sit in the background while they do their hair and makeup and costume them you know wardrobe them and yeah yeah i think they feed you you oh know. yeah. 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 I think, I think it's good to mention here that when you're on set and you know this, you don't want to start asking the people around you. Like there's the first AD or the second AD that they're going to give you. That's going to take care of you, tell you where to go, where the holding tank is, where you're supposed to stay, where the child's supposed to go first, second, third, they're going to hair and makeup and they're going into a dry rehearsal or whatever they're doing, but you really can't start asking lots of industry questions to all of these people. So you have to be so careful because they're all doing their job, right? They're yeah. all busy. And it is, I think one of the things that struck me about being on set is it's very fragmented, meaning there's different teams of people for different things that operate in their own cylinder. And, yes. and generally speaking, they're not all communicating with one another and doing things collaboratively, right? It's not like a big team scenario. Mm -hmm. Wardrobe is wardrobe. Hair is hair. Sound mm -hmm. people are sound people. Camera yes. people are camera people. They all stay in their lane. 
yeah to do their yeah, job like people their walking job. around and all like all there's all these things happening and no one's really talking to each other <laughs> <You're> <laughs> like, oh my god wow <laughs> Thanks for watching the Making It Happen, a career in the performing arts podcast. Tune in next Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern for part two of my interview with Teresa Pfefferly. If you'd like to connect with Teresa or Lila and continue to follow Lila's professional journey, follow her on Instagram at Lila Pfefferly. Need more information? Visit lbctalent.com and follow me on socials at Lisa Solek underscore LBC Talent. By sharing our stories, we can help other talented individuals land the career of their dreams. If you're enjoying this podcast, please like and subscribe below and hit the bell for notifications.